Welcome to the next episode of Brandland. I'm your host, Garrett Justice. I'm also joined by David Aspig on my team here at Lucid Press. My co-host in crime here is going to help keep me on the right track. David, how's it going today? That's right. It's going well. Good. Good to be well, here. We're, we're excited to welcome our guest today, who's Chris Wallace. He's the co-founder and president at Interview Group. Chris, how's it going? It's going well. Thanks for having me today, gentlemen. How is everything going in the Philadelphia area today? Guys, today, today is one year. Today is one year to the day that we scrambled from our offices. And I'm actually in our office today, one of the handful of times in the last year I've been back. But um, things are good. It feels good. The weather's warming up. It feels like a new day is ahead here, um, including spring. So uh, everybody in Philadelphia is in good spirits. Well, that's good to hear. I think it's really similar for us. I think it was just this last week where we hit a year of, you know, working from home, our company as well. So I know many are in that same boat. It's exciting to see some of these companies starting to get back into things as we hopefully get a grip here on, you know, the pandemic and, you know, things are looking up that getting that spring fever a little bit, huh? For sure. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Chris, I'm super excited to dive into our topic today. Uh, before we do, though, tell our listeners a little bit more about your background and what your company interview group does. Sure. So my background is, um, you know, I <clears throat> sometimes say that, that, that I've been a salesperson throughout my career, but I think it's more of a, a salesperson by birth um, <laughs> in terms of, you know, my family and, and what the folks in my family do. But um, the, the DNA of our team, most of the people on our team is in sales. And I started my career in sales working for, you know, large consumer brands, you know, large, you know, fortune, fortune 1000 companies, a variety of different, different companies. And, you know, having been out there and kind of lived the life of a salesperson for years, I kind of, you know, got to, um, got to see the way that things work and sort of live the life of having to hit a quota. And then, um, you know, over time I had the opportunity to, um, start my own, my own, uh, consulting, uh, consulting shop and, you know, really applied a lot of what, you know, I saw as a, as a bag carrying salesperson to help organizations really connect their, their corporate vision and their brand vision with their frontline team. So we really do bring a, 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 a true uh, walk a mile in your shoes perspective to helping organizations reach their sales and service teams. That's awesome. So I guess uh, a follow-up question on that is, are there certain types of companies that you and your, your organization consults with the most? Um, yes. So I look at it as there's kind of three, I think of three categories of company. There's B2C companies, which is pr primarily what we work with is direct to consumer B2C companies. Then there's B2B2C who are, that's a big growing part of our business, which is product companies that go to market through distributors and, and, and retailers or dealers. And then there's B2B. The B2B place isn't really our stock and trade. We're very much focused on consumer brands big investments in marketing and advertising. How are you, you know, really doing that alignment between the marketing side of the house and the frontline side of the house? Um, that's been our focus is the B2B to C and the B2C. Awesome. Well, I'm super excited based on, you know, those companies that you have worked with and that experience that you and your agency have to really dive into this topic today. I, I think it's kind of a fascinating idea for, you know, a niche where your company is really focused on how do you translate that, brand to customer experience. And so I want to dive into that topic a little bit more today and mm. talk a little bit more about that. And I could think that mm. kind of is a, is a great segue into kind of the first question we have for you, which is, you know, as, as you and I talked about, you know, what do we talk about today and, and, and what do we focus on? You know, this idea came up that, you know, one of the hardest things that it seems like for marketing teams often to do mm. is align that brand story that they create with the more tangible frontline customer experience that, you, you know, and, and I'm curious based on, you know, your experience and the customers that you have worked with, why is that? Why is that such a challenge for so many companies to translate that brand story to the tangible customer experience? Um, well, I really think it starts with definition, right? I think that in a lot of cases, um, the branding exercise, the, the, the marketing exercise really has been an externally focused activity and, and, and you know, job within an organization. And the, the marketers haven't really been tasked with making sure that, that that brand message lives inside the organization. And you use the perfect word, which is translation. That translation, um, organizations 
are realizing now that they need to make that translation, which is here's who we say we are going to be. How does that translate into actions that we will deliver? How do we mm -hmm. act? It, it, tr it typically brand has been so much about words, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that people are realizing that brands need to be about actions. And I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, people ask, you know, who are some examples of companies that do this? Well, if I were to say to you, which airline is, which airline brand is associated with telling jokes on their planes? Most people would say Southwest, right? They know that Southwest are the people that tell jokes on their planes. Um, they have a brand that they want to be. They have translated that into behaviors. They have branded the joke on the, on the airplane as, as something that aligns with their brand. We're fun, love, like they talk about love at Southwest. So it's that translation process that the best brands seem to do well in saying, here's what we say, right? Here, here's what, what the mouth says. What do the feet and hands do to, to back that up? Yeah, I love that. I think that's such an important thing to focus on. I, th I think as marketers, we often are so excited about the story and the brand, and this is who we are, and this is what we believe in, but we forget to take it that one step further for that flight attendant who, what does that mean for them, right? Like I, I would imagine that that idea for telling jokes for Southwest probably hmm. came about because there was that connection and translation between marketing and someone on the front lines who knows where that like initial idea came from. But so often if you just leave it up to people on the front lines to hope that they get what they should, what they should go about and do in terms of customer experience as a result of the brand, I think you fall short. So I think it's, it's a fascinating topic and something that's so relevant for every brand out there. It just, it needs to be intentional. And I think that, you know, when you say, why do they struggle? I mean, the last thing I ever want to do is, um, is, is to, you know, run down on companies for the way that they've approached things, T things evolve, right? The marketplace evolves. And, you know, we believe strongly that brands are competing. I, I truly believe that a couple of years from now, brand and customer experience are almost going to mean the same thing. Whereas mm -hmm. before brand was your logo and your tagline and things like that. I think we're just moving beyond that because consumer expectations have changed and they're aligning themselves, not with what's cool necessarily, but what's convenient and safe and, and, you know, dependable from an experience standpoint. So we think that they're going to become synonymous and that deliberate process of really thinking about, you know, I met with a CMO a couple of years ago and she used the phrase, walk the talk. We are going to talk the talk, but we'll, can we walk the talk? And I just mm -hmm. thought that that was such a good way to think about this. You know, one yeah. thing I, I'm hearing is it may not be about uh, communicating more, it's, it's how you communicate. You mentioned, how do you translate that? Like, do you, do you think companies are communicating enough with their frontline employees or just not in the right way? Uh, is, it, is it weird if I offer you a Zoom hug? Like when, when people say things that smart, <laughs> I, I offer a Zoom hug or a, a Zoom <laughs> fist bump or something. But no, David, you, there you go, fist bump. You're, 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 you're spot on with that. It's, um, so we, um, we do not believe that organization, we talk about the difference between knowledge and belief, okay? And organizations, you know, the traditional thought process is we have to get more, inf like if they're not doing what we want, they need more information, more emails from internal comms or, or you know, more trainings posted and things like that. But the goal being to get them to, to so they know something. Well, people can know something. It doesn't mean that they're going to follow through and act on that, right? This is about changing behaviors. So, you know, we talk about the difference of pushing past knowledge and getting to belief and we truly don't believe as organizations look at this, a lot of times they say, well, they're not doing it. Let's train them more. Let's give them more information. It's not more of the thing that's not moving them now. It's you need a new thing to move them. So I don't believe it's more communications. I think that people are buried in communications. I think it has to be um, a different way of connecting with your people to help them experience and immerse themselves in the brand so they, so they then can believe in it as opposed to yeah, I read that email the other day. Yeah, sure, I'll say that. But it doesn't mean they're going to say it with conviction. Do you have, you know, I think the Southwest was a, a good example. Um, just kind of get wrap my mind around it. Do you have like a specific example of, of that playing out like with one of your customers where uh, maybe they were communicating, but it, it was the wrong way and, and they took a shift and, and how they communicated that or, or translated that with, with their front lines? Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna use the example of um, we worked with a, a large um, online jewelry retailer, 
um, I won't name names, but um, we worked with a large on, online jewelry retailer and they, a lot of their sales came through a, a call center team. And the, um, <clears throat> we were brought in for a specific task to, to help them with something specific. And the first day we were in their call center, we saw the poster up on the wall that had their, their process, the, their, their, you know, their methodology, their, you know, kind of their customer experience, you know, steps, like steps one through five. And what companies bring us in to do is say, here's the brand that we are, are the ways that we are acting aligned with that brand? Because when you talk about what the connection is, if you are acting in a way that's consistent with your brand, you have studied your customers, you know what messages are going to resonate with your customers, you've gotten, you, you've done the work to get your brand on point. If people act consistently with that, you're going to differentiate more and you're going to win more. You win more sales, you win more deals. It's really that simple. And in the conversation we had with this jewelry retailer, we said, we looked at that poster and we said, who did that? Like, oh, somebody, you know, just, you know, sketched out five steps or whatever, made posters out of it. Well, what we did was we started talking to their people. We started talking to their brand team. And ultimately, the way that the process goes for us is, uh, to your point earlier, we are connecting with the people who are talking to customers every day. And we're helping them, or excuse me, they're helping us build this concept of, okay, here is, here's what our brand is. Here's a way that I could be acting that really aligns with the brand. And in their case, I'll give you an example, expertise, right? Their brand was, we're the experts, okay? We are truly diamond experts. Everybody on our phones are, 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 are certified, you know, diamond experts and things like that. And the process that they had, they were giving away their, ex they, were, they were not leveraging their expertise at all. They were not taking control of the conversation. The, cu the customer was leading it all over the place and they were not leveraging the expertise that drove somebody to click on their website and call their, you know, call their call center in the first place. So our whole thing is if you, if you can deliver on what got the customer there in the first place, you're going to be better off doing that in collaboration with the people who serve the customers and linking the brand to, you know, what they do every day. That's where the magic happens. It's got to be their idea. That's a long way of saying, we try to make sure that it's coming and sourced from the frontline teams. It's not just something that's being pushed down from corporate. You know, what's so fascinating to me about this, Chris, is I'm hearing you say this is um, kind of going back to, you know, what you and David were talking about right before that is that difference between knowledge and action. It's kind of ironic to me that so many marketing teams struggle with that. I mean, I think everyone does, and it's, it's not a knock on marketing teams, but it is ironic because shouldn't that be what marketing teams are best at? Because as we work with customers, it's great. Marketing is, is not about helping them know something. It's about getting them to do something. And so I think one of the most underutilized marketing channels that we often forget as marketers is internal marketing. So how can we help our employees, especially those on the front line, not only know something more, but do something, believe something, be bought into this brand. And that was the thought that I had as, as you're just sharing that example and talking through it. We, we, we talk about what we do is running internal marketing campaigns, right? Um, you know, sort of our, our secret sauce that we use, we have a, a, a proprietary process called the brand transfer score. And essentially what that is doing is it's market research. We took a market research mechanic. We, we um, sort of optimized it, made some tweaks to it uh, to optimize it for an internal audience. And whereas companies are gathering voice of the customer data on their products, their services, their offering, we're gathering voice of the internal customer data. We're taking that back and we're determining where we don't, it's not gaps in knowledge. We do not, we're not confirmation of learning. We're not the quiz at the end of your training. This is, we want to know what they believe, right? We talk about belief, confidence, and pride. Where do they have belief, confidence, and pride in their, in the brand and the products they represent or where do they lack it, right? Probably more importantly, where do they lack it? And we take data and then the campaigns that we run inside the, the, the organizations we work with are driven from that data. The messages are, are fine-tuned based on that data. And by the time it reaches the front line, the goal is somebody for to look at it and say, it's about time corporate started listening to us, right? <laughs> it feels like it came from them. It feels genuine. It feels authentic. It feels like they were involved. It didn't happen to them. It happened with them. So that process is something that we use, but it's no different than any marketing campaign. You gather your data, you understand your audience, you tune the message, and you push out cool tactics. They're going to grab attention. To your point, Garrett, um, I truly believe that marketing is behavior change on a mass scale. What are marketers trying to do? They're trying to drive foot traffic. They're trying to drive calls. 
They want you to act in a certain way, but most organizations don't take that approach when it comes to moving their people. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. It's such an interesting and relevant topic. I think for every, every company out there, I think most could, could do this better and think about, you know, how do you move those internal clients or customers, which are your frontline employees to action, just like you're trying to move your customers to action. So it's fascinating. So I'm curious on this point too, you know, um, what's the cost for organizations tangibly when that customer experience doesn't really match that brand promise? What have you seen? So we, we've done research. We actually did it um, in partnership with, a, with a, a customer experience technology company called Focus Vision. We did some research a couple of years ago, back in 2019. And what we found was we, we asked about this idea of kind of that, that brand alignment, that brand connection between the, the corporate and the front lines. And the feedback we got from marketers was the people that were doing this well, Okay, the folks that were that felt like they, they were confident that there was a strong connection with their front line, which wasn't the majority of them, but the people that were doing it well, they prescribed a value of 62% of those people said the value to their organization is $10 million or more annually that they are gaining by having that alignment of messaging. So the only regret wow. we had in the study was not having a higher option for how much or for how much it costs or what the value of it was, right? If 62% choose the highest option that you offered, the, the scale wasn't high enough. So um, we looked at that and said, okay, now granted, these were medium and large size companies. So these were, these were larger, larger companies we were talking to, but you can look at your own organization. I'll go back to the example of the, the diamond jewelry company that we worked with. The work that we did to take who they were, they were advertising themselves and marketing themselves to be and ensuring that the people who represented them acted in a way that was consistent with the, the external messaging. And that's really what it was. It's oversimplified, but that's what it was. Um, the work that we did in a six month period, the work that we did with them uh, showed a 28 times ROI, what they paid for us wow. versus what they got back. And that was just in the six months. This was a couple of years ago. And the, the amount that they have, uh, they've been able to reap as a result of the performance. And it was just we believe in this. We believe in the value proposition that we have as an organization, and we're going to stand behind it on our phone calls. And it turned into a 28x uh, ROI. And that was only in six months. So it pays off in a really big way for organizations. So the, the, the cost and the benefit here, it really is a no brainer if you know what metrics to focus on. It's fascinating. That's astounding. Just those seeing those metrics for sure. So um, I've, uh, I'm going to jump in here. Do you do you find that, um, so in that example, uh, it, it seemed like there was a lot of work done on the front lines to really uh, understand, believe, and, and speak to the messaging, you know, that was developed, likely at the corporate level. Do you find that during that process, the messaging needs to change? Like there's a mismatch of like, actually, we need to maybe change the way we're talking about ourselves because this isn't, you know, it's not matching what's happening on the front lines. Does that ever it, work its way back up? Um, it, it almost every time it does. Okay. Now we are not, we are not your branding agency. We are not there to change your advertisements, change your digital banner display ads or anything like that. That's not what we do. But inevitably what we're finding is by gathering scalable data-driven, you know, insights from the frontline teams, we are coming back and showing the product back is inevitable that they, they see something where they say, you know what, maybe that our, our patented proprietary technology actually does resonate with people more. If our sales team is telling us that that's four slots higher in terms of what they believe is important to customers than we think it is, well, maybe we should be thinking about that. It's not our intent to completely change their external messaging, but it always happens that they, they learn something that they didn't think before. And what happens 100% of the time is we find a... Um, we find an area, a pocket of confidence that the frontline teams have in, in the brand or in the product that wasn't nece didn't necessarily occur to the corporate team. And we always ask them the same question. Are they wrong? Are they wrong if they are focusing on that? Are, is that a place where you can win in your value proposition? And if they say yes, we say, well, if, it, if you can win there and they're confident in it, go with it. Like, let's amplify that. Just because it wasn't message you know internally before it doesn't mean we can't start messaging it now if it does not go against the message that you're delivering externally and you believe you can win there well well 
amplify it. So it's, it works both ways, to be honest. Yeah, they probably feel like they're hurt. Like that's bringing up something that maybe they will feel heard if that feedback works its way back up because what the frontline is experiencing and seeing if it's not represented in the messaging and then it becomes part of the messaging, I, f- I feel like it would be a lot easier for them to buy in because it's what they're already thinking and feeling on the front lines. It, it sounds like marketing, doesn't it? Right, like, I mean, it really, it, you know, to go back to, to Garrett's point, it is if you understand your audience, when the message if, and, and, you, and you have data to support it and you tune that message, by the time it goes back out, it feels like it's talking to you, right? And that's, that's really the goal is, you know, and again, I'm going to keep using that word translate, but the way you talk to customers isn't exactly the way that you talk to your people. It shouldn't be. In so many organizations, you know, the, the, the challenge here is for marketers to start taking greater responsibility for this, right? It's not that they're not doing a good job. It's recognizing that they could be impacting both their performance and the company's performance by, by reaching over the, the aisle, so to speak, and helping that, that sales and service team more. And it really is something that they can, they can make those tangible connections pretty quickly. So the challenge here is for marketers to, to you know, have the, the confidence to be able to do that. Yeah, that's so fascinating. It's making me think too, like in addition to, you know, these, these business benefits that are tangible that you've talked about, you know, there's probably also, you know, to, to date what David was just saying to his point a minute ago too, there's also probably these intangible benefits that come from doing something like this, like that tighter culture and trust and alignment behind between those frontline teams and like that corporate marketing team, right? Like I can see how that can help build and strengthen ties there that, you know, could be so valuable for everything else going forward internally as well. Yeah. And the best way I can think to, to, you know, share how that's played out in our experience is if you want somebody to do something different, the best thing to do is to start with a question, not a statement. And as soon as organizations start looking at their frontline teams as a, as a source of insight and as a group of people to be won over, then the mindset can start to shift. What we do is not any harder or more expensive than what organizations are doing now. It's not, it's just different. And it, it's that idea of uh, you gain control by giving it up, so to speak. And if you feel like driving that message down is going to be how you win people over, the reality is if you, if you go with a pull strategy instead of a push strategy, again, that's what marketers do, right? Marketers can't force their customers into compliance, right? They have to pull them through the process. You know, we believe that, like you said, it just deepens that culture, deepens that relationship throughout the organization. Yeah, that's great. Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, Chris, um, on this next question too, is, you know, without divulging too much of like your secret sauce, right? Obviously if companies wanted to do this well, and they were a good fit, they would come to leverage the expertise of you and your company. But for those who are listening, who might be smaller or might not be in that right fit, what are those tangible takeaways that those listeners can take back and apply in their businesses? How should they be thinking about measuring that misalignment and what can they do to fix it? Yeah. So I'm going to give, I'm going to give you an exercise and people have probably been through this. This isn't proprietary by any stretch of the imagination, but what we've done with our organization, we're a small team, right? It's one of those things where, um, as a small company who does, you know, does consulting like ours, you always have to ask yourself, are we eating our, eating our own dog food, so to speak, mm-hmm. right? So um, you look at it and say, you know, we, we went through a process with our team. We looked at our own customer experience and we said, okay, this is who we are as a brand. And we, when we started the company, we were very uh, firm on who we wanted to be as a brand. Like we knew what we wanted our, our voice and tone to be and things like that. And we've really stuck with that. So when we sat down to really think about the customer experience and what it was like to do business with us, we, we've often gone back to the think, feel, and do exercise, which is what do we want customers to think about us? How do, they, how do we want it to feel when they work with us? What do we want them to do as a result? And we go through this think, feel, do exercise. And it's a great alignment exercise to say, okay, we know who we want to be, but how do we translate that into you know, what, the, you know, what the experience will be for the customers? And then once you have the think, feel, and do, that's sort of the end point. That's the outcome that we want. It becomes easier to map in, okay, what can we be doing to help them think that or feel that or make sure that they do that? So um, that would be one thing that I would say is is a great exercise is the think, feel, do around your brand, around your customer experience. Um, The second thing I will say is anytime you're asking your your team for feedback, 
um, you're winning, right? As soon as you start gathering that feedback on a regular basis, if you're a small team, um, do it with focus groups, have, right, you know, have regular conversations, um, doing it through, through studies and surveys and things like that. It gets a lot easier when, the, when the, the sample size is bigger. Most of the organizations we work with have bigger sample sizes. So we're able to get statistically relevant data. Um, if your team's a, you know, a couple dozen people, do focus groups or regular check-ins or lunch conversations where you're gathering feedback on what people are hearing. Um, frontline feedback should be business intelligence. It doesn't matter the size of your organization. Yeah. Great, great advice and great tips. Well, Chris, this has been an awesome conversation, super enlightening, and I think applicable for you know all of our listeners out there, regardless of the type of company that they're in. So I really appreciate you taking the time to jump on and share some of your experiences and your insights with us today. You know, as we wrap up here, if there are listeners who want to get in touch with you or with your company to learn more, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, website is, you know, you can learn more information about our company. It's interviewgroup.com. And I want to be clear, it's I-N-N-E-R, interview as in taking an interview of your brand. Um, so interview.com is, I'm sorry, interviewgroup.com is our is our website. Um, for folks that want to connect with me directly, very active on LinkedIn, you know, publishing articles, you know, sharing, you know, sharing content, things like that. Um, so Chris Wallace, um, look in Philadelphia. Chris Wallace is not an uncommon name. Um, so uh, you, you'll find many Chris Wallaces, but look for one in Philadelphia with the interview group logo. And um, that's the best way to find me. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Chris. We'll drop the links to both your LinkedIn profile and your company's website on the page so people can find that easier too. But thanks again so much for taking the time to share your insights with us. And we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks for the chance to be here, guys. I appreciate it.